First Peter chapter 2, we're carrying on in this. If you remember what Peter, the thought that he started in this was uh, just the idea that, that we're to submit to authority uh, and, and to, to those writers, uh, to those readers, even in unjust authority. Um, we're, we're to submit to that leadership um, for the Lord's sake. The, not to be um, not to be in rebellion against that leadership so as to bring more harm, but really not to be in rebellion to that leadership so that it did not stop the the spread of the gospel. And the the the, the image there is that that we lay aside the wrongdoings that might be done to us, and rather than reviling against those and being rebellious, which will bring more harm and more damage to the mission that we've been given, and that is to share the gospel, we're to submit. And recognizing that authority, whether it's good authority or evil authority, there's no authority on earth that God has not allowed. And we don't understand the ways of God. We cannot fathom and understand and begin to comprehend the plan and will of God. But Peter tells us that this is the Lord's will, that we, that we live our lives that way. Again, remembering that we're a part of another kingdom. We're not a part. We're not a part of this kingdom. We're not a part of the world's kingdom. Uh, I am a citizen of the United States of America, and so are you. And I love my country. I'm proud of my country. I've traveled the world, folks. There's not another place that I would rather be. However, my allegiance as a Christ follower is not to this country, not to this nation, not to this flag. My allegiance, your allegiance as a Christ follower, based on what the Word of God says, is to His kingdom. And so that's what Peter is calling us to. Then he, then he begins um, in verse... Uh, in, in, in verse uh, 21, he says, For to those who have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Let's unpack this. For those who have been called, the Bible teaches clearly, and I don't understand it. I'll be honest with you. I don't understand calling an election, but I can't deny it. It's there. God has called us unto himself. We would not have been able to come to God had he not called us. It wasn't that we sought him out. God may bring circumstances to move us to seek him out, but he is the initiator in that relationship. So those of us who are in Christ, we've been called. He says, and because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Follow in what steps? In context here, he's talking about the sufferings of Christ. Paul said in one of his letters that he, he, he wanted to fulfill or fill up the sufferings of Christ that are still left. And so Jesus said, listen, if, they, if they've reviled me, if they persecuted me, of course they're going to persecute you. And so he tells us that Christ is an example to us in that type of suffering. Again, We've not suffered the way that these believers have suffered. We have not suffered the way that I have been with those in Romania and Hungary and Moldova and Cuba and other countries around the world, Nicaragua, where they have suffered under communism and the gospel and Russia I've been to where, where the gospel was stamped out. We've not suffered near to the extent that they have. But I do believe there's a day that's coming when we are going to be reviled in that way. Maybe not to the extent that these believers did, but, but we've had it pretty good in America. Thank God we've had it good in that. And, and thank God that the church in America has really led out in all of the world in mission endeavors. God's graced us with that opportunity uh, but the days are coming where that's going to begin to to dwindle and shut down. He says Christ has been an example for us. And, and here's the example that he lays out. He committed no sin, neither was found in his mouth. Neither deceit was not found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him 
who judges justly. So when Jesus was standing there before Pilate, when Jesus was being taken to the cross or, or bearing the cross when he was taken, when he was crucified, when he was being spit upon, when he was being kicked, when he was being slapped, when he was being criticized, when he was being mocked, he did not open his mouth. But he willingly entrusted his life and his circumstances to the judge who judges all. And there's an application for us in that, that when we are reviled, and, and you might say, well, I'm not reviled. Yeah, 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 you are. Um, and I see sometimes how we restrike back in that reviling. It's so easy. Something comes up on Facebook that we disagree with or we take offense at, and, and we immediately respond back in a reviling way. Now, it's one thing to make an apology for truth. It's one thing to defend truth with, with, with truth, um, but it's quite another thing to respond in a way that is just like the person who initiated the offense, the offense that we take offense to. Jesus is our example in that. Where he was reviled, he didn't revile back. And I know that's hard. Man, that's hard. There's sometimes I've just got to take my fingers and put them under my lap so that I don't strike back in a reviling way. But he calls us to do that. It's right here in the Word. This is what he says. Jesus didn't open his mouth. He didn't revile. And that is our example. We're to entrust that judgment to the one who judges impartially. It's hard to trust God. It's hard to trust God especially when we feel like we've got to make a defense for ourselves. But he says, trust me in this. Just trust this to God and ask God to work in that situation to turn the reviler away. I've learned to do that many times in my life as a pastor. There are striking things that come to me on a very regular basis. Um, most of the time, it's it's interjection. It can be a difference of opinion or whatever. Um, but I, I've, I've, I've learned that, man, you only throw fuel on the fire when you do that. And it's not godly. It, it's not spirit-led. And so we have to learn to be controlled by the Holy Spirit and entrust those things to the one who judges impartially. Um, when, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. He didn't come back and say, I'm going to get you. Just wait until I come at the last judgment. That's not, we know the last judgment. The final judgment is going to come. And on that day, it'll be righteous judgment that's meted out. He didn't threaten in return, but he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. Then I love this, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. He bore all of our sins. He who knew no sin, as he just says, he took your sin and my sin on himself. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he who knew no sin became sin for us. We call that in theological terms, imputation. My sins were, your sins were imputed to Christ, were placed on him while he was there on the cross. Not only were our sins placed on him, if that was just it, it wouldn't have been sufficient. But the wrath of a holy God, he has become our propitiation, Paul says in Romans and John says in 1 John. He, he became the wrath satisfier for us. Paul Turner and I were talking about this yesterday, and Paul, I hope I don't blow your lesson. But the question is, when we, when we put it in terms of he took on the sins of the whole world, sometimes we can kind of uh, think, well, my sins were minor. No. If it were only your sins that he bore on the cross, it would have so defiled him. You see, we have to think of it in terms of my sin. My sin he bore on the cross. Those, those attitudes that are, that are just wicked. Those thoughts that are evil. Those actions that are deplorable. And we say, well, my actions are deplorable. Listen, 
Our smallest offensive action is deplorable in the sight of a holy God. He bore those sins for us. He who knew no sin bore our sins for us on the cross. <laughs> I, if that gets old to somebody, then I question whether or not they know the Lord or I question whether or not they're in close fellowship with the Lord. You see, that should always always move our hearts to worship him, that he bore our sins for us, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Here's that other part of imputation. You see, our sins were imputed to Jesus, and when we trusted him as our Savior, his righteousness was imputed to us. To the same degree that our sins were imputed to him, his righteousness now has been imputed to us. That we stand before a holy God in Christ Jesus, righteous, pure, and holy. Oh my goodness. If we know ourselves and how utterly sinful we are, again, that causes us to say, Oh my God, Lord, what you've done for me. Oh, the wondrousness of that. By his wounds you have been healed not directly quoting, but repeating what Isaiah said, by his stripes we've been healed. Now, we take that in the physical sense, and yeah, there's healing that comes in Christ, but not always. What he's talking about is the greatest healing we could ever receive, and that is the healing from our sin. We were healed completely by the, sin, by the blood of Jesus. And so he's purchased for us that ultimate healing, we're all going to face a day when this body breaks down and we die. But the hope that we have is because of the blood of Jesus, he has given us eternal healing that we can be in eternal relationship with Christ. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Aren't you glad that God drew you by the Holy Spirit that he gave you the faith to even believe, that he called you, that you're one of his chosen elect. And he has determined that you will be conformed to the likeness of Christ. If you can't praise him in that, something's wrong. Father, we thank you for...